Welcome, Ilan Jura here at the Ayn Rand Institute. Um, my guest today is the journalist and author Graham Wood. He has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the New Yorker. Currently, he's a staff writer at The Atlantic, and he also teaches a course at Yale University. In uh, 2015, he wrote an article titled, What ISIS Really Wants? Not only did this article contribute to an ongoing debate about the Islamist phenomenon, it really touched a nerve. Uh, to give you a sense of its impact and resonance, I, I found these statistics reading about the article uh, and the debate that it spawned. So by one reckoning, uh, Graham's article was the most read digital article that year, period. Uh, and at one point it was receiving 10,000 views a day. And, and to give you context, that's a lot for a magazine article. Um, and I think uh, if you recall in November 2015, the, um, there were jihadist attacks in the streets of Paris, France. And that night of those attacks, um, Graham's article received an extraordinary 1.9 million views, which, which is just sort of blockbuster level for magazine articles. Uh, Graham's book, which builds on his article, is called The Way of the Strangers, Encounters with the Islamic State, which is a fascinating and incisive book, and it's well worth your time, and that's what I uh, hope we can discuss today. Graham, welcome, and thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, before we get into the meat of your writing on ISIS, I, I want to just set some context and, and uh, you know, ISIS has faded from the headlines somewhat lately. So I want to just start by rewinding a few years and just to give people, remind people, or if they don't know a lot, just recapture the significance of this phenomenon. Um, so it bursts on the scene in, to most people's awareness in 2014, um, capturing territory in Iraq and declaring itself a kind of state. So maybe you can just sketch for us, what was the scope and size of the Islamic State, the size of population, uh, and the, just a flavor of its laws and, and practices? Yeah, so in 2014, it had existed in a kind of guerrilla form, uh, and it had taken some territory in, um, in Syria, but nobody was expecting that it was going to take over the city of Mosul, Iraq, which is the second largest city in, in Iraq. Uh, and by the time it did, so this is mid-2014, uh, it was controlling a territory that was about the size of England. Uh, it was controlling a population that was probably about 8 million strong. Um, but what was really confusing to, I think, a lot of people was that uh, it's not just that it had 8 million people behind it. It also seemed to have a following that was international. And what was making it so strong was in part that somehow it had encouraged and succeeded in getting people to, to, to come in the tens of thousands to fight alongside it. So it wasn't just 8 million, it was the promise that there might be many, 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 many more beyond that. So those are just the ones who were willing to, to risk their lives and probably die as very, very young to do this. It might have many more who, who, were, who were behind it. So when it finally took that city, there was a very real sense that there was no understanding of how far this phenomenon would go. It had become a military power that could defeat a garrison of Iraqi army. So now we know that at, by the middle of 2014 that there might be a very large number of people who are supportive. Uh, and even the people who are just present right now, right at that moment, were strong enough to, to, uh, to, to defeat what seemed like much, much better uh, uh, armed and entrenched powers. And uh, from what I've read, the, the people who are moving, who, who are coming and flocking to live there, I mean, it wouldn't surprise to hear that some of them were from Middle East or other kind of uh, Muslim majority countries, but in fact, many of them were from uh, privileged societies, pretty free societies around the world, right? Yeah, that's right. So there were a lot of people who were coming from places where uh, life might not have been that great. So. Um, Iraq, Sunni areas of Iraq would be an, an obvious area for, to, to, to draw people from. Um, and then if you go further, Tunisia, Libya. And then if you go further, though, you start to get quite confusing if, if you think that, that what's ultimately driving this is, say, grievance. So you're finding people coming from Norway, from France, um, thousands of people coming from Russia. Um, and so, yeah, it, there, are, there are many different um, kind of classical models of how terrorism works. And uh, none of them explained all of this. Uh, some of them would explain, oh yeah, well, Sunni Iraqis feel like they, they've got the short end of some political stick, but that doesn't explain the Indonesians who show up or Cambodians or, or you name it. So the internationalism of, of the group was really shocking and presented an analytic challenge to people like me who were trying to figure out what was going on. 
Okay, so let's dive into that. So in your article and also in your book, you 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 ask a question like, what what is ISIS really about? And um, so what what what? So in a few words, what is your finding and what to, to get at what was made your article so controversial? Yeah. So what I first was looking at was how is ISIS different from Al Qaeda? Because you know, at by 2014 we had unfortunately spent at least 13 years in public discussion of what Al Qaeda was and how to fight it. So my, my first thought was um, maybe this is just a manifestation of Al Qaeda. It's a mean version of Al Qaeda and I uh, meaner. And what I was kind of surprised to find was that it, it was, it was that, but it was much more than that. Um, what it was all about was taking what Al Qaeda viewed as a distant religious project that was the, the culmination of what Al Qaeda thought of as really more of a political struggle. And instead flipping that around and ignoring many of the things that Al Qaeda had focused on politically, uh, specifically Israel, specifically American support for authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. And instead taking that and saying that comes later. First we get the religion right. And then proposing a very strongly intolerant version of Sunni Islam. Um, so intolerant that it considered actually what Al Qaeda was doing um, in many ways and, uh, 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 false, even to the point of apostasy, and to say nothing of, of, of most of the other 1.6 billion Muslims. So it was, it was an entity that, that took all the ferocity of Al Qaeda, but then married that to a religious view that we really hadn't seen in, uh, in any of the, the forms of, of jihadism that we had unfortunately become familiar with over the, the previous decade and a half. So one of the things you, you highlight is that um, for Islamic State, having territory was really significant, whereas Al-Qaeda was on a different model. So what, what's the difference for them? Why did it matter so much? Yeah, there was a really fascinating moment in Yemen where you know, Yemen became very chaotic and there were areas of Yemen that Al-Qaeda pretty much ruled. They could do whatever they wanted. Uh, nobody had a monopoly on violence, uh, and Al Qaeda had a chance to build a state. And um, Al Qaeda Central, Bin Laden, Zawahiri, wrote to them and said, "Don't build a state. It's not for, our, for in our best interest because people will expect us to collect their trash, vaccinate their children, etc." So Al Qaeda was backing off that project, and ISIS said, "No. Again, we flip it on our on its head, and we say." the state comes first because what we need to do is implement Islamic law and rule according to Islam. And then many other things will, will flow naturally from that. So what did that mean? It meant controlling enough territory so that the Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi could be in charge as a unitary executive and implement his version of Islamic law. And they said, once you do that, it, it's like flipping on a light switch for a, a, a grid that you've built for, for, for many years. And that, that uh, you know, is powered by the same engine that powered previous caliphates thousands of, a thousand years ago. So they, they thought that by doing that, they would be focusing on A, what's right, and then B, what's pragmatic, because they thought enough Muslims would rally from around the world to that, where they would actually accomplish the political goals that Al Qaeda put first by instead making the religious purity primary. Uh, and for a while, as I say, it, it looked like that might actually work. So help us understand um, the significance for uh, Islamic State of what does it mean to be a Muslim? Because as you put it, you, um, they viewed Al-Qaeda as a, uh, almost like apostates or maybe fully apostates. And, and uh, so what counts for them as a real Muslim? And what about the rest of the billion, the billion point six plus? Or what are they considered? Yeah, so there are different uh, dimensions that their version of Islam varied um, varied on from, from the Muslim majority. So probably the most salient, though, is this political one. The idea that you can't really be Muslim unless you're living in an Islamic state that rules in the proper way. So that doesn't mean you can live in Pakistan, where Islam is the state religion. doesn't mean you can live in the UK, where you can worship as you please, but it's not the state religion there either. It means there are certain aspects of what Islam is that are not just a matter of belief that you can practice privately in your home, but the government has to, has to, has to rule that way and kind of force you into the, the, the proper way according to, to, to their interpretation. So what the Islamic State said in, in that regard was, what you gotta do is, is uh, establish that state, and once you've done it, 
then there is suddenly a personal obligation uh, for every Muslim to go to that place and, and uh, you know, be a subject uh, obedient to, to the caliph. Um, to that, they added, that's the political side. Theologically, they also had a very weird and intolerant version of kind of Sunni chauvinism, uh, where, you know, Al-Qaeda had fought against the Shia. Uh, Al-Qaeda did, certainly didn't look positively on the Shia, but they were willing to make certain compromises. So, uh, for example, the Taliban. The Taliban are Hanafi Muslims. Uh, that's the official uh, legal school of the Taliban. And for bin Laden, for Zawahiri, the Hanafism was incorrect. I mean, they, they grew up and believed in a kind of modified version of Hanbalism, which is the legal school that's official in Saudi Arabia. But they said, look, we can all get along. These are minor differences, and these Taliban are our friends. Um, similarly, the Shia, they say the Shia are, are uh, borderline unbelievers, perhaps even unbelievers, and we should fight against them. But when Zawahiri, I mean, uh, excuse me, when, when um, Zarqawi was in Iraq in the early 2000s and killing Shia, like bloodbaths, uh, killing uh, civilians left and right, central Al-Qaeda went to him and said, chill out a bit. I mean, these people are just ordinary people. They're just they're stupid, they're ignorant, and you, you, can't, you can't just kill them because they might be uh, corrigible. Um, whereas ISIS took both of those and said, no, 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 you, you cannot be indulgent toward, toward the Taliban in their errors. You cannot be forgiving toward the Shia. You have to kill the Shia and you have to correct the Taliban and fight them if necessary. Uh, so they considered the Taliban apostates. They considered the Shia apostates and um, they, they said like, this is our brand. We're gonna go against all these people with, with full force. So one of the things you argue in your article and also in your book is that the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. I, I'm paraphrasing, maybe quoting exactly. So I think that rankled a lot of people. So what what's some of the evidence um, for that? And then there, there are obviously counter arguments that people make. So I'm going to just state a couple of them. So one is, um, you know, some of the members of, of ISIS were former members of the Ba'ath Party of Iraq, and they, you know, the view that they kind of were the nucleus, and they brought in the other people just tricking them into the religion. Another one, which many people find plausible, is that look at the barbarity of ISIS. These are just sociopaths. They're just playing out this real-life video game where they actually kill people. And, and you, you, you know, there's this um, anecdote which you relate in the book, which has sort of made the rounds. Um, a couple of the, a couple of guys who went from the UK to uh, Syria, they had bought uh, Islam for dummies on their way. Uh, um, and so the implication is, and there's evidence for others, not really knowing that much about religion. So the foot soldier view is they're, they're not that religious. So the, the common thread is there's all kinds of evidence that eh, they're not that religious. So, so, so flesh out for us, what is, your, what is some of the evidence for the view that it is Islamic, that it is rooted in some conception of religious text and then how do you respond to some of those views all right so the argument that it is islamic i want to make clear that there's a there's a distinction that that i, I think a lot of the critics uh not really the ones that you quoted um fail to make which is between saying that something islamic is islamic and then saying that it's right that it has the correct interpretation of islam and the latter the idea that it's the correct interpretation of islam is not something that i even take up at all I and mean, i don't write as a muslim i don't write as a christian i write as a journalist and as a journalist i, I don't say that there's that what the true meaning of christmas is i don't say what the true meaning of islam is what i do say is i take up the first question the different question which which is a descriptive one is what isis is doing something that muslims have done historically something that muslims have historically found legally uh, um, binding on them? Are they picking up parts of the tradition and then using it? Or are they going from outside the tradition? So, you know, if they were to talk about uh, the proletariat, uh, if they were to talk about capital, if they were, these, are, these are, are concepts that, of course, come from Marx. They don't come from Islam. Well, if you look at the concepts that they were reaching toward and the historical examples that they're reaching toward, it's not coming out of the 19th century. It's not coming out of 19th century Germany. It's, it's coming out of this 1400 year um, multivalent tradition of, of Islam that does include things like 
uh, slavery, like expansion, uh, an expansionary uh, empire of conquest called the Caliphate. Uh, ISIS w was without any doubt reaching into that tradition and putting, of course, their spin on it and reaching selectively. I mean, there's all sorts of other things, of course, in the Islamic tradition. But to say that it's Islamic is just to say that when they're reaching back for references, for justification, for a way of, of phrasing their own project to themselves, they were looking in the Islamic tradition. Uh, and um, their enemies, by the way, many of them are doing the same. They're also looking in the Islamic tradition. But to say that they're Islamic is not to judge them or to judge Islam, but just to say there are a lot of things that Muslims have done and ISIS is doing them too. Um, now, some of the specific criticisms that, that you brought up, um, I have to say that they have not aged very well. The idea that ISIS is a Ba'athist project uh, was pushed forward at the beginning. And uh, what was the evidence for that? There were people within ISIS who had once, uh, before 2003, when, when the Ba'ath party and Saddam Hussein were deposed, had once been Ba'athists. So that's true. It, it is, there's no doubt that there were ISIS, people in ISIS leadership circles who were, who were Ba'athists. Now, what did ISIS do to them? Uh, they made them repent. There was actually a process where they could say, you had been in the bath party, you can do the following things, get a sponsor, it's like going to an AA meeting or something, and then you pay up, and then you, um, you, you have to like, go through a process that's called istitaba, uh, that was formalized. Um, the people who went from the bath party early on and became senior ISIS operatives were true believers, and we have strong evidence for that. They did not just flip over their, their you know, they didn't just rip off their, the patches on their arm and then become ISIS followers. It was a long period of their choosing the most religiously extreme ways to, to, be, to be rebels. And by the time uh, ISIS became, you know, in our consciousness, it was one of the few things that was left to, as, as ways to do that, as ways to be a rebel. And there were some people who refused to do that. I mean, Izzat Ibrahim Aduri was this, uh, I think he's number three, the, the, one of the aces in the deck of cards, um, when uh, the, the invasion of Iraq happened. He fought both on ISIS's side uh, in the very early days of the taking of Mosul and then against ISIS. So there have been many, many cases where there were uh, alliances of, opp of opportunity that uh, eventually ISIS would shed as, as it was clear that the, the, the people they were working with were not on the same page ideologically. Now, the fact that there were with ISIS sociopaths, and this is obviously true because we see people doing uh, truly horrifying things. I, I, don't, I hope I don't have to, 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 to describe them in, in great detail. Um, so in that sense, yes, if, if you think that it's impossible for something to be Islamic, if it also includes torture, burning people alive, sexual and enslavement, then I don't really know what to say other than like most religions that have a 1500 year history and that come out of antiquity, there were practices that we now consider barbaric that were, that were in that, that history. Uh, and all of these were, were among them. Um, there were cases of, of people who were considered blessed in the Islamic tradition uh, who burned people alive. That was, that was the punishment that they chose. Uh, the practice of sex slavery is not only in the tradition, but in most of the tradition. Uh, there have been, there's been a practice of codified slavery. You may do this, you may not do that to your slave. One of the things that, that has always been understood to be permitted is having sex with your female slave. So that ISIS was doing this looks psychopathic to us and may in fact be psychopathic, but that doesn't at all mean that it can't be part of the faith. So there were a number of things that came up along these lines that um, I, I think were, were often brought up in a spirit of apology for Islam. I mean, there's a lot of people who, who did not want, as Muslims, to see ISIS uh, held forth as the example of what Islam is. And what I argued was that we should see Islam the way we see Christianity or any other religion, as having many things within it not just the Islamic State, but you know, the many other types of Islam that are, are more common and, and, and um, more defensible from, from a universalist, uh, you know, humane position. Um, we need to, 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 to be able to understand that all of these exist at once. But is ISIS Islamic? It's squarely within the tradition. 
let me pick up one of those one thread of that, which is because um, I think it has resonance for people, which is you know if you if you interview some of the people who who moved to ISIS to fight for ISIS and you ask them you know, you quiz them on on scripture and how well they know it and so you you will find people who don't know that much and then I mentioned that anecdote about the two who had Islam for dummies. I, I, I thought the way you handled it in the book is really interesting and I, can, I think pretty convincing that the way to think about this is the, the way we assume we understand that is just not right. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring it up again because this is one anecdote of a, a couple creeps who went from the UK to ISIS territory and it was in their amazon.co.uk shopping cart. People looked at it find out what they'd been up to. And it was Islam for dummies, the Quran for dummies. And yeah, you, you could see exactly how the, the, the joke would then go. Obviously, the people who go there don't know anything is for, about, about Islam. They don't care about Islam. And I, I don't know that that's the inference that you draw from that. Um, first of all, someone who is looking up the Quran for dummies is evidently quite interested in the Quran. Uh, it, it was there are a number of different other books that the person could have been reading uh, in fact, most other books that exist in the world that, that, that someone could have been looking for that would have shown that they were interested in something else. What it shows is, is that they had a novice understanding of this uh, or were buying books for someone else who had a novice understanding of this, but were quite focused on it. Um, beyond that, I think that there's also a, a very telling confusion that people have between whether someone has been believing something for a long time that is the duration of the belief, and then on one hand, and then maybe the sincerity of the belief or the reality of the belief on the other. And it is true that many of the people who have gone to ISIS, especially as, as foreign travelers, have not been ISIS believers for a long time. They have recently been converted to this cause, and that's one of the big projects of ISIS, is to convert people to this cause. So once you realize that these things do not vary uh, dependently, that is, there are people who are extremely ardent believers who have just come to their belief. And there are people who have been believers for a very long time whose belief is mild or non-existent. So I, I, I think that if you look at, at the intensity of the belief and the signs of its sincerity, um, you'll, you'll find pretty quickly that, that people who have gone to ISIS very sincerely believe and believe very intensely. What's the evidence for that? Well, they go to Syria mm -hmm. and attempt to die. So that, that's a pretty, I think would say a pretty strong piece of evidence that, that they really do believe these things. Now, th there's one other confusion that I think comes up from, from this, which is um, you can always find people who have gone to ISIS and who know very little, who are idiots. There are some people who have gone there with, de with developmental disabilities. And yes, you could point to them and say, ah, well, this is not a mullah. This is not a trained religious scholar. And you're right. But that also doesn't mean that the person has gone uh, with total ignorance or without sincerity. Uh, if you were to look, for example, at the US military, um, I like this comparison a lot. It, it seems to, 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 to be nearly one-to-one. -one. You were to ask people, you know, do you believe in the United States? Do you believe in the Constitution? Are you a patriot? Um, I think most people would say yes in the US military. Then if you were to ask them, what does the Sixth Amendment say? Uh, tell me about the history of the Article of Confederation. The chances are that, that, that the person you're speaking to will have no idea what these things are. Uh, and it doesn't mean the person's not a patriot. It doesn't mean the person isn't devoted to, to the US Constitution. It just means that there are within any fighting group, some people who are ideological, some people who know a lot about this, and some people who don't, but are nonetheless committed. And if you went to the US Army and you found a JAG who had been educated at Harvard Law School, that person could answer all of these questions in great detail. Likewise, if you go to the right people with ISIS, you find people who, who know uh, everything about, about, about scripture and about history and can defend these, these things, these interpretations uh, quite eloquently. So I wanna to turn to another group of people looking at ISIS. And um, in your book, you, you point out that sort of at the beginning when ISIS is a phenomenon that we're trying to understand, um, the people that you would naturally turn to, scholars of the Middle East, scholars of Islam, um, a number of them, surprisingly, are either denying the Islamic character of ISIS, as, as you argue for it, 
or they're just looking away and not wanting to deal with it. Um, and you have a quote here, and it's, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to read it because I think it's really apt. Uh, you, you put it this way. You say, um, the level of ignorance among some of these scholars um, is as appalling as if a scholar of Marxism declared the Soviet Union, quote, not Marxist and turned out to be unfamiliar with the name Trotsky or Lenin or the title of any, anything either of them wrote, uh, end quote. And to me that, that's, um, and, and there's another anecdote of a scholar who was giving a talk about ISIS, but they didn't quote any of the fatwas or religious rulings or, or, or any of their um, statements. So, I mean, I, I, that's really troubling uh, to put it mildly, but so I'm interested, how, why do you think there is, um, why do people, and especially scholars maybe, find it so difficult to believe that ISIS is as devout as it claims and as, as apocalyptic and as Islamic as it claims to be? I think there's a, there's a number of things going on here. The, the first one is that ISIS does occupy part of the Islamic tradition. Uh, it doesn't occupy the most interesting part of it though. Uh, you know, the invention of algebra, the, 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 the many interesting theological disputes that have happened in the history of Islam. If I were a scholar of Islam, then it would be very, a very peculiar choice for me to be studying a kind of weird version of Islam that ISIS follows. So not too surprising that if you go to an Islamic studies department, they're focusing on Al-Ghazali or they're focusing on Ibn Khaldun and not focusing on some weirdos in the desert in 2014. So that's, that's the kind of more forgivable type of, of, of uh, ignorance of the ISIS project. There's also though, among a lot of scholars, a real desire to defend the territory of Islam by saying uh, the respectability of that territory, by really focusing on the nice parts of it uh, and not saying anything that would make someone possibly think that there was uh, some merit to ISIS's position. Now, as a scholar of Islam, of course, there's, you have no, just like I as a journalist don't talk about the true Islam, a scholar of Islam doesn't, isn't required to talk about what the true Islam, or true Islam is either. But there's still a sense of, of, you could call it political correctness, trying to say, no, no, ISIS has nothing to do with this, and then wanting to opine about it on the basis of, of this adjacent scholarship that they may have, and say that without actually looking with any specifics. And as you quote me writing, it, it, you have to look at the specifics. ISIS has been prolific in the essays that, it, that it's put out, the fatawa. There is, is uh, just an abundance of material that you could read. And you'd have to read it to make these kinds of diagnoses to say it has nothing to do with Islam. And yet the number of people who actually read it is pretty small and they tend not to be in the tenured professoriate. So yeah, it would be like, as you say, going to, to um, looking at the Soviet Union and saying, doesn't have anything to, do, anything to do with Marxism. You could argue that it's a warped version of Marxism, but I don't think you could really argue that without looking at Lenin's speeches and looking at Trotsky, looking at you know, the, the, the long history of, of, of the Soviet Union. And that's kind of what Islamic studies scholars in, in large part tried to do. Now, the fact that you can also talk to them privately and then ask them about this, and they're much more uh, open to the possibility that, that ISIS uh, actually has represent a version of Islam shows that, yeah, and I've done that in many, many, many occasions, shows that it, it, it's, it's largely political, it's largely a matter of embarrassment that they don't say that publicly. I was fascinated, um, a number of the scholars you talk to have sort of the, their careers intersect with Princeton University and, and the Department of Near Eastern Studies there. So what, what's the story there? Because it seems like it's a pocket of, of scholars, or scholar, an area of scholarship where there is some willingness to engage in, in sort of um, that uh, research. Yeah, it shows that it doesn't take very many people to, to have a kind of locus of scholarship on, on something when it's being avoided by a field at large. But at, at Princeton, there is a funny, um, a funny gravitational pull that has allowed more people than at, as, as far as I can tell, any other Islamic studies center to look at ISIS with, with clear eyes. Uh, there's one person there named Bernard Haeckel, uh, who is a scholar of modern Saudi Arabia and of 19th century Islamic law. And he was someone who, who was studying a kind of ISIS-like uh, incursion uh, 
um, of Wahhabists into Yemen in the 18th and early 19th century. So he, he had ironically just been able to see a, a, a historical example of the, the intellectual um, expansion of, of an ISIS-like group. And then through that, and then through personal acquaintance with, with jihadists in Yemen in the 1990s, was able to speak knowledgeably about what, what ISIS and Al-Qaeda were. He's the, he was till recently the chairman of Nietzsche New Eastern Studies at, at Princeton and, and um, minted a, a, a few grad students who are um, really excellent um, um, students of the group. Um, and in the longer history of the department, there are people like Michael Cook, who still teaches there, who has just written what I, what I consider the, the, the best scholarly treatment of the question of whether Islam uh, and a few other religions to which it's being compared in, in, in his book, Ancient Religions and Modern Politics, whether uh, whether religion uh, influences the political manifestations in the societies where it's, where it's practiced. Um, and then before him, there was even more famously Bernard Lewis, who was maybe best remembered uh, politically for having uh, been a kind of intellectual godfather to the neoconservative movement, and who was a polymath who, who taught generations of students and from 1974 onward at Princeton, uh, who's also, I think, sympathetic to some of these, these um, politically incorrect lines of inquiry. So I want to turn to, just to dip into your book for a moment. Um, so you, part of what you do is you profile a number of people who are sympathizers or followers of ISIS that, that are not actually in Syria or Iraq. And one of them that I found fascinating is a character called, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Yahya the American. Yes. Um, so maybe you could just give us a brief sketch of who he is, his path to ISIS, and what role he played in this phenomenon. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just describe how I found him. I, I was speaking to a person who was a quite influential Australian ideologue who was widely followed by ISIS supporters. And um, at one point, he just mentioned that he knew an American and that American was his teacher. And he didn't say anything more. He was very cagey about this person's identity. But I picked up a few breadcrumbs here and there and was able to identify him. And, and sure enough, there was an American. Uh, and not only was there an American, he, he grew up um, in Colorado and in Texas. And he lived just a few blocks from where I went to high school. So it was pretty shocking to discover that, that this guy who was described to me as a kind of leader among a certain sect of ISIS English-speaking followers um, was like basically my neighbor. So... Um, who was he? He was the son of, or he is the son of um, an American Air Force colonel, uh, radiologist, uh, and he grew up as a as an Army and Air Force brat. Uh, and at some point, he just took a turn. It was soon after September 11. He converted, and I think out of a rejection of his very patriotic Republican dad, uh, he decided he was going to go full bore into radical Islam. And he, he spent much of the next 10 years or so kind of wandering around um, in Syria, in Egypt, in Europe, uh, not really with much in the way of, of gainful employment, but getting more radical as time went by. And eventually he was caught in a, um, a cyber crime, a jihadist cyber crime, uh, not a widely noticed uh, uh, prosecution, but he got put away for a few years. And once he got out, he started planning. He, he had, during that time, really become enamored of the, of the view that as a Muslim, there was only one way for him to live, and that was in a caliphate. And that it would be an event of world historical importance for a caliphate to be respawned so that he could die personally, so he and his family could, they could live and die as full Muslims, which they couldn't do otherwise. He certainly couldn't do it in the United States. So um, this guy, after being in... in Egypt during the Arab Spring, moved to to, uh, to Turkey, and then went to Syria. And that's the last that anyone has seen of him. He became one of the group's top propagandists uh, and was writing for Dabik magazine, was um, was encouraging people to come to, to, to ISIS, and was really an extraordinary figure of transformation, going from being a, a you know, Texas uh, libertarian um, big Ron Paul supporter at one point, and then finally deciding that the fulfillment of that of of, of that uh, that view of the world was for him to go and be a loyal subject of Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. 
And just so the beak is the, the English language magazine that they put out. I, I read a few editions of that. Um, it's really well done. Um, I mean, it's articulate. It's, it's well written. Uh, and, and is he the one he is, he was, he, you said involved in that. He was. Yeah. I, I know that he was involved in it because there were some essays that came out that, uh, um, some of which I had seen attributed to him before they were published in Davik magazine, uh, and some of which just have his fingerprints all over them. So, um, it doesn't mean he was the, the editor of it, but he was certainly involved in its, its, its writing and distribution. I want to just step back a minute and talk about a slightly wider issue uh, that I think comes up in, in trying to understand Islamic State and, and the jihadist phenomenon. Um, I think it can be challenging because th it can be like a minefield in a way and that um, just bringing it up can, can invite the accusation that you or, or whoever is doing it is an Islamophobe. And, um, and on this point, I want to just get your perspective on this. So I'm sure you you know the work of um, Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz. They, they had a book a few years ago, and it was a documentary, Islam and the Future of Tolerance. And, and they talk about Islamophobia as a, as a term that's not really helpful. And in fact, they argue, and I, I'm sympathetic with this, uh, that it, it, it prevents us from really getting at the, uh, at the truth and, and having frank discussions and analysis. Um, and at the same time, there is a phenomenon that we can call bigotry or prejudice against Muslim or anti-Muslim prejudice. And I think that, I mean, that's obviously wrong. And there's no place for that. But so in your writing on it, on Islamic State and in, in talks you give, have, has that come up? And what, what's your reaction to this, this idea of Islamophobia? Yeah, I, I think it might be helpful to, to, to describe how we met not too long ago. That's true, yeah. We were at a panel that was being, uh, it was in the process of, people were trying to shut it down um, because of, of the assumption that it would be, I'm not sure if the word Islamophobic was used, but there was a, a range of political objections to, to the speakers. Um, and it, it was funny to note that uh, the objections were being made without any knowledge of what we were going to say or what your perspective or my perspective was on these things. So it's a very touchy environment. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I don't think, I've, I've not been accused of Islamophobia myself, but I, I've, I've certainly been involved in the conversations about it and I'm very sensitive to it. I mean, that this is, um, as Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz have, have, have said, this is a category that, that has, that, could be used to describe a, a phenomenon that is indeed extremely pernicious and needs to be fought. And that's the right way to use that, that word. It has expanded though to include a range of, of, of uh, discourse that is not Islamophobic at all. Uh, and that in, in fact is healthy and is supporting um, Muslims who are not ISIS. So I, I think we, we, we do need to use the word much much more cautiously than we are. To say that ISIS is Islamic and then be called Islamophobic is, in my mind, just a, a, it's akin to just saying, I don't want to talk about Islam. I only want to hear nice things about, about Muslims. I only want to talk about nice Muslims. And that, I, I think, it is uh, not just in the long term, but in the, in the medium term, a very dangerous thing for, for um, people who for Muslims, I mean, what we want to get to is a point where we can talk about Islam the way we talk about Christianity, the way we can talk about what in the United States is the majority religion. And with Christianity, nobody has any difficulty saying that there are Christian zealots out there who bomb abortion clinics. And are they Christian? Yes, they're Christian, but that's not a compliment to say they're Christian. It's, it's just a description that they're doing some, something that Christians have done recently and long before that is going off and killing people because they don't think that their Christianity is, is, is good enough. Now, if you say with the, you know, the simplest transposition, the same thing about Muslims, then people's hackles will get up and yeah, you'll be called Islamophobic. What we want to get is the, the same reaction that any other religion should get, which is an understanding that there's a wide range of ways that people practice this faith, and it includes good people, bad people, 
just like any other uh, type of, of, of mass human activity. So um, just to, to round out the conversation, I, one of the things I appreciate in your essay and in your book particularly is that you, I think it's just a brave thing to do, is that you push on an issue that deserves a lot more attention. And I, I, I would cast, classify it as the, the, this widespread underappreciation, or maybe even denial, but underappreciation at least, of the role of ideas and belief in animating the Islamist phenomenon. Um, and I want to bring in a different thread, but I think it, it, it really connects here, which is you had a piece um, in the Atlantic just after the New Zealand massacre at two mosques where the, the white supremacists came in and, and killed upwards of 50 people. And I, I thought it was really insightful. So this is what I took away from it. And maybe you can just elaborate on your, your perspective. It was, you were pointing out that there's a kind of inconsistency in the public conversation about um, the way we understand white supremacists as they're animated by evil ideas and we can point to them and here's their manifestos and we understand it in that sense that certain beliefs lead to certain actions. But that isn't at all the way we think about the Islamist phenomenon or not enough. Um, and so, I mean, I hope that's a way, a fair summary of what you said, but maybe you can just elaborate on how you see it. Yeah, I, I watched uh, with with the same horror as anyone else the, the killings in Christchurch, and and looking at the responses that came in after it, it 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 felt like I was just taking crazy pills because there were people who were saying things that I'm sure they would not have said had this been an Islamist killer. Specifically, they would say, "What we're looking at here is a set of terrible ideas." that is being disseminated across the globe and that causes people to do horrible things. And we need to fight them. We need to fight them as ideas. And in the past, when you had said the same things about what ISIS was doing, when you said that ISIS was a set of terrible ideas that were being disseminated across the globe, then they'd say, no, 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 no. We need to look at the, the individual experiences of people who have gone to ISIS, the fact that they've been stopped on the street by cops unjustly that they have been um, taken in for interrogation at airports. Uh, and this is what causes people to do that. If you had said the same thing about this guy in Christchurch who murders 50 people who are praying and said, oh, it was because one time he got mugged by a Muslim. It was because he traveled to Pakistan and he wasn't treated very nicely or was given a hard time about his Christianity. Then people would quite rightly have said to you that the excuses you were making for him were contemptible, um, that you were, you were overlooking by far the most important aspect of his, of his story, which is that he had been infected with some of the worst ideas known to mankind. So what I hope we can do from seeing this hypocrisy is start to be a little bit more straightforward about the way we talk about these things. We should be talking about the ideas in his manifesto, where they come from, and we should be doing the same thing when we talk about, about Islamists. That There was, um, I think, revealed very plainly when we started seeing people uh, quickly rushing for uh, materialist explanations for the Islamic State. Um, we, we started to see a, a real allergy toward believing that ideas can can push people to, to do bad things. And then we see the same allergy in, in another direction when you find that, that um, kind of soft apologists for the Christchurch killer, um, what, what they would say. I, I personally think, and, and I defend in, in my book, the belief that, that ideas matter hugely and we should dissect them really carefully, find out where they come from. Well, I appreciate your time, Graham. It's been a fascinating conversation. I want to just remind people the name of your book and where they can find it. It's The Way of the Strangers, Encounters with the Islamic State, and I'm sure it's on Amazon and everywhere else. And where can people find you online? Online, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at GCAW, those are my initials, on Twitter. And uh, you can read my stuff in The Atlantic. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's oh, been I fun. appreciate it. Thanks so much, Graham. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.